Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? And they replied, some say you are John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the prophets. But Jesus asked, but who do you think I am? Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Then Jesus told them and warned them not to tell anyone who he was. Thank you, Janice. That was amazing. Who do you say that I am? That's the question that Jesus poses to the disciples. We've discovered in our journey through Mark already that Jesus is, first of all, a rabbi, a teacher. And there are those that have been called to follow him. A great honor, a distinction. He's clearly uh, got it going on as a teacher. But there's more to it than that, as they soon discover he's a rabbi with shmika, power. He's more prophet, actually, than rabbi. And so as a prophet, they begin to see similarities between him and some of the greats. But he's actually much more than prophet. He's Jesus the Christ. Christos in the Greek is anointed one. Meshia in Hebrew is anointed one, Jesus the Messiah. Who do you say that I am? This is the question in the book of Mark. Remember last week, in verse 1 of chapter 1, we identified that this was a book about Jesus, Son of God. And that opening statement informs the direction in which this entire gospel goes as we look at the conversion of the apostles, our disciples, from disciples to apostles, ultimately. From people who didn't know who Jesus was other than that he was a teacher, to people who could conclude that the very man they had journeyed with was the Son of God. Who do you say that I am is the core question that informs our lives every single day. If Jesus is just a good teacher, then I don't know of any religion that can claim any kind of direct contact, and any kind of formed contact between God and man. Lots of good teachers have come. And a lot of people hold that opinion. Jesus was a good teacher. Buddha was a good teacher. Muhammad was a good teacher. A lot of people hold to the idea that there have been many uh, self-actualized individuals, people with a capacity to manage energy, if you will, and do interesting things. They're just people. If that's the answer to the question, you're going to have a very different kind of faith journey than a Christian will. If your answer is, I don't know, you may be seeking, and I think Mark as the evangelist wants to share with you a particular truth. Your search is over. Yes, he's a great teacher. Yes actually has all the qualifications of prophet. Yes, as much as he defeats our cultural expectations of who we think Messiah ought to be, he is the Messiah, the promised one. And now this week, as we look at the progression in Mark's gospel, we see that Jesus is not only Messiah, the anointed one, come to Israel, but that he is somehow going to adopt this very ambiguous title, 
Son of man. Son of man. We'll get to this in just a moment. But I want to I wanna just crystallize for a moment in our minds this final declaration of Peter's. It's because it's an important one. And Jesus tells Peter, it's so, so vital and so important in terms of the mission of Christ, that he tells Peter, tell no one of this. Now, in other Gospels, when Peter makes this profound confession, thou art the Christ, Jesus says, it's on this rock that I'll build my kingdom. I don't discount the words of the other Gospels in this. What I want to focus on is the way in which Mark is going to shape and form and pull our attention to an ultimate truth. And so as we listen to the words that are read today, and as we listen to what I share today about those, I hope what will be in the back of your mind is this question, who do I say that he is? Because it makes all the difference. Because if you come to the same conclusion that the Gospel of Mark comes to at the end, that surely this is the Son of God, your life, just like the lives of the disciples, can never, ever be the same. To be in personal encounter with the living God is inevitably a changing thing, a life-changing thing. But just think about it for a minute. Think about musicians you've admired who you got to shake their hand after a concert or get an autograph. Think about that star sighting you had when you were visiting Hollywood one day, and oh, isn't that John Travolta on the sidewalk there? Ah! Whatever, whoever you like. Christy Alley, whatever. One of the Kardashians. Pick your poison. We're a culture of celebrity, and those kinds of events don't usually change our lives, but we remember them. But occasionally we meet somebody that we've admired, respect, studied, something. And that encounter... Maybe it's a workshop, maybe they say something to us, give us a phrase, a sentence, an idea. Maybe it's something that they help us to see or understand, and our lives are never the same after that moment. And that is only a fractional sort of encounter, because encountering the living God is so much more. So, as we progress this morning... I hope you'll stay with me. We're doing a little structural work, and I know for some that may not be interesting. I think for most of us, hopefully, it will be as we look at the way in which Mark structures his gospel in order to help us hear. You see, I just want to make a comment about this so that you understand. A lot of people are afraid of looking at the structure of Scripture. I have no idea why. It just baffles me. They're, they're afraid that somehow we disrespect it when we give it careful analysis. Again, I, I have no idea why that is. It baffles me. There are people who are afraid to consider that Scripture is in fact, according to its own word, a divine speaking through a human voice that the human and the divine partner in the creation of what has become sacred to us by way of word. And if we're not willing to look at any of these pieces, we miss the Spirit's leading. We miss the craft and the artistry. We miss the genius of Scripture and the Scripture writers who are so artfully many times so brilliantly and creatively and in, and in such an inspired manner trying to help us see who Jesus is? That's the central question.
second reading from the Gospel of Mark are selected verses from chapters 8, 9, and 10. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and teachers, teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples, and he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about while we were on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who would be the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last, and a servant to all. They were on their way up to Jerusalem when Jesus, leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who, were, who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going to go up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. The Gentiles will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, it was probably difficult for you to detect the exact demarcations between the three different passages being read. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's important that you, uh, if you were listening, to note that the same thing was said in each of the three passages. Three times we heard a prediction of the death of Jesus. But before I spend too much time on that, I want to turn your attention to Daniel 7, 13, and 14. There we go. Daniel 7, 13, and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there was before me one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is the one, is one that will never be destroyed. That was read as our call to worship today. One before me like a son of man. Now, Ezekiel uses the phrase son of man over and over and over and over again. If you've read the book of Ezekiel, you know Son of Man. It's a very common phrase in Ezekiel. And it literally means Son of Adam. It's, it's Son of Man. And it's used as if addressing a prophet. Ezekiel is a prophet. God seems to be using this language to speak to him. And so in terms of Ezekiel, the, is, the, the Jews are so used to hearing this phrase, Son of Man, especially at the time of Christ. They're familiar with the book of Ezekiel. This doesn't really speak to them in any kind of controversial or interesting way. But when you get to Daniel, which is the oldest reference to Son of Man, something begins to layer differently. 
and you begin to see what it is in this passage. Like a son of man, first he's coming in the clouds of heaven. That's unique. He's in the presence of the Ancient of Days, and that's capitalized. We're referring to God, of course, and led into his presence. He's given authority, glory, power, sovereign power. He's worshipped. His dominion is everlasting, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. We are talking about not the son of man of Ezekiel, not a prophet, not an ordinary son of Adam. We're talking about son of man in glory, connected to the king of kings, lord of lords. There's another reference that's just worth, uh, worth reading, and that is in Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation. And I want to make sure I get the right text here. Give me a minute, a second. It's Revelation, uh, I want to say one. One fourteen is probably where it is here. Yes, I turned, 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the seven lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all his brilliance, its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. This is a description of the resurrected and glorified Christ who is in heaven. And the word used is Son of Man. What's very interesting to me is this particular reference shows the Son of Man in a white robe that's long, with a golden sash. And that harkens back to Hebrews, if you will. It's a priestly reference. So, okay, if this has been a little droll, let me help you, a dull, let me help you put it together now. We have reference to the Son of Man in Ezekiel. That's Ezekiel is a prophet. Son of Man as prophet. But we have reference in Daniel to something more extraordinary, someone who's actually connected to and with and empowered by the Ancient of Days. And in Revelation, we see an image of the one who was crucified, now ablaze, as it were, in glory. And he's wearing a priestly garment. And so we have a couple of overlays to this idea of Son of Man as Jesus uses the phrase in Mark and as Mark recounts Jesus' use of the phrase. The overlays are the Old Testament rendering of Jesus or the Son of Man as connected to Ancient of Days with authority and power in a kingdom that won't end. And for those listening, that is vaguely messianic. Without Jesus using that title himself, without saying, yeah, I'm the Messiah, when he refers to himself as Son of Man, that in the minds of everyone who heard was vaguely messianic. And it hinted at the type of Messiah and kind of Messiah he might be. We get confirmation of that in Revelation, which is written well after the book of Mark. And so Revelation is just borrowing this language from Ezekiel, from Daniel, from Mark. And you have John the Revelator saying, I see one 
who was as a son of man. Because forever, though Christ was the creator of humankind, by taking on flesh, he forever identifies with humankind. An amazing condescension and an amazing elevation at the same time. So we come to the passages that were read in Mark. Thank you, Milt. And we have a series of things going on, and I'm going to try not to make this too confusing. Turn to 831. 831. Eight thirty one is a prediction, right? He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And this prediction gets repeated. Look at nine two. You might have to turn in your Bible. Nine two. Which we're going to look at in just a few moments. It's the transfiguration, and, and I'm going to cover that separately. Turn then again to 9.30 and 31, which was read in our reading. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. Then look at 10.32 to 34. Again, he took aside the twelve and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So the prediction is made four times in this cycle of simply three chapters, 8, 9, and 10. With each prediction, there's a gross misunderstanding that follows on the part of those who hear. 8.31 was the prediction, remember, after three days rise again. But in 8.32, Jesus spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you see it? Jesus being counseled by one of his disciples. I do the same thing. And boy, do I feel stupid most of the time. And I should. I'm guessing you do too. Ever counsel God? You do. I know you. You've counseled God. You've told God how it needs to be for you. I know you have. You have told him you've got it all figured out, you see the path, you know the way, and you've told him how it needs to be for you. We laugh at Peter, and when we laugh at Peter, we laugh at ourselves because we've told God how it needs to be. Peter begins to counsel Jesus, rebuke him, actually. So there's always misunderstanding following this prediction. <laughs> If we look at 9, 14 to 27, which again I'm going to deal with in just a few minutes, we're going to read that separately, that's the transfiguration, you'll see another misunderstanding. And in the reading that was just read, 9, 32 to 34, it says of the disciples, they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. And when we find them in 33, 34, well, it gets even worse. 33, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in a the house, they asked him, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because they were talking about who was the greatest. That will come up. In cycle 4, we have 1035 to 41, and that was not in your reading, so if you'll turn over very quickly, you'll find that. 1035 to 41. The misunderstanding is the request of James and John, and it's as obnoxious as they come. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. You're laughing again. I know this is us. This is us talking to Jesus. 
What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. They didn't understand. Three times, four times actually, Jesus has told them that the Son of Man must suffer and die. And what do they hear? Messiah, power, glory, kingdom, control, Romans gone. Let me find my place. Jesus said to them in 38, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm to be baptized with? We can, they answered. (laughs) Let's talk about this for just a minute. It's very, very hard, very painful. It's very close to our experience, is it? I don't know about you, but I can definitely drink the cup of glory. Any of you with me? When we're talking about fame, elevation, position, power, food, wealth. When we're talking about glory, sign me up. I can drink that cup. Can I be baptized with the baptism he's about to be baptized with? Well, wasn't he baptized with John and water and didn't the Spirit come upon him? Sure, baptize me with that Spirit. I'm up for that too. Jesus is not talking about that. He's talking about the cup of his suffering. He's talking about a night of agony in Gethsemane in which he senses God the Father has departed from him. He's talking about going to the cross not knowing whether he's achieved his objective and whether he'll ever rise from that again. He's predicted it. But in that moment of darkness, he can't see to the other side. Jesus is talking about a baptism of fire. Can you endure the accusation the unfairness, the mistreatment? Can you endure the abandonment? Can you endure? Can you be baptized with what I'm going to be baptized with? I don't know who wrote it, but at least one Christian author has gotten it right and put it bluntly. Christianity is hard. If you thought you had signed up for something easy, you're mistaken. The glory will be there, but it will be there only after we've taken up our crosses and followed the suffering Christ. The glory will be there, but only after we've done for the least of these as he would have. The glory will be there, but we get baptized with fire, same as he. The glory will be there when he comes in the clouds with his reward, but we're not to sit at his right or his left. And if we're going to have any chance of glorification at all, it says quite plainly we must be the servant of everybody. You want to be first. If you want to be the greatest, You need to be the servant of all. Christianity is not easy. Mark makes that plain. This repetitious cycle that Mark gives us makes it plain. And the repetition goes on. There's this misunderstanding and following it Jesus teaches in every single example. In 8.34, he begins to teach the way of the cross. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for you to gain the world and forfeit your soul? You've heard these passages before. In cycle two, which is again 
uh, transfiguration, but it followed by the casting out of an evil spirit. We read, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciple asked him privately, why couldn't we drive out this demon? And he replied, it only comes through prayer. Jesus teaching his disciples about their failures. Cycle 3, 935 to 1031. Jesus teaches, anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. And he took a child and taking the child in his arms, he said, whoever welcomes one of these little ones in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me not, uh, does, excuse me, whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. He goes in on to do the one about if anyone causes one of these children, little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for a large millstone to be hung around their neck and then be cast into the sea. Jesus gives four predictions. He follows it with teaching on four misperceptions and misunderstandings, and he ends up teaching them about the nature of the kingdom. And in every time through these stories, the disciples are caught flat-footed because they're thinking, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Remember how they didn't get it about the bread? They were confused when Jesus broke the bread. They were confused and terrified when he stilled the waves. They don't yet have a vision of who he is. And we come back to our saying, who do you say that I am? makes a big difference, makes a huge difference. So Mark gives us a vision of a different kind of Messiah, one who is not just Messiah, but Son of Man, and as we'll eventually see, not just priestly, but kingly, for he's a son of David, and not just priestly and kingly, but divine, for he is the Son of God. Our third reading from the Gospel of Mark comes from chapter 9, starting in verse 2, found on page 932. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to the high mountain. There they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what else to say. He was frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead might mean. And they said to him, why do teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it was written about him. The challenging passage. The transfiguration, at least to many commentators, stands on its own. It's seen as something different or separate from this, but I think Richard Peace, who I'm basing this series on, has it right. This is actually a fourth iteration. 
what is written in this fits into what we've read so far. But it gives us a different picture and new information. Here, three of the disciples are with him high on a mountain. And we get a picture of Jesus in this moment on the mountain, very much a picture of him glorified, not dissimilar from this picture that we find in Revelation that I just read to you from Revelation 1.14 and following, or that thereabouts, 1.12 and following. And the disciples see in this appearing Elijah and Moses. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how they recognize somebody they've never met before. And I'm not sure in what sort of vision they appear. We do know from scriptural tradition, right? We know what the scripture says about this. We say that Moses died but was raised from the dead. We could learn that from Jude, correct? We know that Moses had been raised from the dead. So here was a prophet who had seen death, tasted death, but been resurrected as a first fruit, like Jesus was. And we know that Elijah, according to the Old Testament story, was taken without seeing death, translated. And so we have two kinds of prophets, the one who's tasted death and the one who hasn't, present with Jesus, Presumably, and we would, we would agree, alive in heaven, come down to visit and encourage Jesus. So it's, the disciples are seeing these three beings, and I don't know how they know who they are. They know who Jesus is, but they quickly identify the other two, not as angels, not as God himself, but as Moses and Elijah. They don't know what it means. They hear this voice, same voice as was when Jesus was baptized. This is my son with whom I'm, I'm very pleased, whom I love. Listen to him. That same voice speaks now. This is the second time they've heard it, and they don't know what to make of it. God the Father is speaking, saying, this is my son. The word son of man is being used here, and the disciples, they don't have any idea what's going on. Peter's very hospitable, though. Oh, this is great. You guys look terrific, by the way. A little bright, but hey, that's, what, am I to, what am I to say about that? Welcome. Well, let us make you a little food and put up a little shelter for you over here. In fact, you can each have your own. That'll keep me busy for a while. I won't have to think about what this vision before me means. I don't understand. They don't understand that Jesus is the culmination of all the prophets. They don't understand that when Jesus says, I tell you, Elijah has come, and they've done everything to him they wish, just as was written about him. They don't understand that in Moses and Elijah, and now in Jesus, are all the prophets that God sent his voice to the people over and over and over again, and they did not hear. Their hearts were hard and their ears were stopped, and they did not listen. And nothing's changed. My ears are stopped. My heart is hard sometimes. I don't listen. I'm not a very good disciple sometimes. Or maybe I fit right in. Take it one way or the other. Jesus is trying, Mark, the gospel of Mark, is trying to teach us something, to show us something powerful. This is not who we think it is. This isn't just a teacher. This isn't just a prophet. This isn't Messiah as we've classically thought of him. This is the suffering servant of Isaiah. <laughs> This is the stone the builders rejected. This is the one on whom a kingdom will be built, a kingdom not of this earth. This is the one who will never be dethroned. This is the one whose kingdom will last forever. And this is the one who will lead to that by the way of suffering and pain. Jesus, 
transfigured teaches us something that fits in with all that Mark is saying. The Son of Man came in glory in this moment and will come in glory. And we can be His.